When you think of the name Square Enix, what games normally pop into your head? Final Fantasy is a big one that's almost synonymous with Square Enix. Chrono Trigger for the OGs that remember it, Nier, Kingdom Hearts, Dragon Quest, and many other beloved series. When a company is known for having great products, you have this notion of expecting them to always drop great games. Until they don't. Babylon Falls, Left Alive, Balan Wonderland, Forspoken, and those are just the big titles that dropped from Square Enix that pretty much flopped. And then you have a relatively unknown smaller game, Various Daylife. Various Daylife. That is the saddest name I have ever seen for a video game. I told you guys, it's an AI generating these games. Various Daylife is a mobile game on the Apple Arcade, which is still available today at a nice price of... $22? That's a lot for an app game. What happens when you have a dedicated port for a mobile game to PC? Well, usually good things. Nikkei has a PC port, which saves my phone a lot of space. And Arknights... Which, we're still waiting for a PC port. However, for various day life, this is what you get when you port an already not so great game to PC. This game is also available on the Nintendo Switch for $28.99 USD, which I don't really recommend anyone buying this game for even $10. Now, while it's available on the Nintendo Switch, this is probably the greatest trick in gaming because it's available on Steam for the same price practically, if not on sale. Now, why I highly recommend if you were to ever get this game is to get it on on Steam is because, well, it's available in three different bundles on Steam featuring games like Triangle Strategy, Live a Live, and Octopath Traveler 2. Other than the fact that Square Enix just really wants to push this game out to everyone, in fact, having various day life will make these other games cheaper. Octopath Traveler 2 is usually $60, but with this bundle, you can get both this game and various day life for $63 USD, rather than buy both games separately for a total of $90. And just by having various day life on your account, you will actually make the other games that you don't have much more cheaper. Square Enix just really wants you to have this game for some odd reason. But first, let's ask the question, what exactly is Various Daylife? Reading the Steam page, we learned that Various Daylife is an all-new adventure daily life RPG from Square Enix, developed by the team that worked on Octopath Traveler and Bravely Default. That team is Team Asano, by the way. We have a name for them. Throw some respect, come on. In the year 211 of the Imperial Era, a new continent was discovered. Explore its every last corners as a settler of Antuisha. Features include character growth through everyday work. Various day life also features 20 different job classes, more than 100 types of work for those jobs to perform, which is a system we'll get into much later. Shape your character how you see fit depending on your choice of work. Overcome dungeons with skill management and the innovative battle system of the three Chas. Overall, it sounds really promising. If you were to see this game on the Nintendo eShop, you would notice that you really can't see reviews for this game. But on Steam, on the other hand, yeah, it's not looking so good. Straight up, the only reason I bought this game is so that it made Octopath Traveler 2 cheaper. It reduced the price of Octopath Traveler 2 by $4, so I decided I might as well give it a go. Okay, but here's a positive review. I was having trouble falling asleep until I played Daylife. Now I can't go further than 5 minutes in the game before falling asleep coma style in my chair. Oh my gosh. Okay, no more reviews. This game looks really charming, and when a team like Team Asano is making the game, I couldn't just sit there and just take these reviews for fact, I wanted to explore it myself. A sad fact about the game is that it's really relatively unknown among so many gamers out there. When I tried researching info for the later stages of the game, I was just not able to find any information because there were so many people that doesn't even know this game exists, but also people only played maybe about one or two hours and quit right after. Well, I did find one person, but it was from a game Game Facts forum post, and it was from a guy who was just wanting to play the game so others didn't have to. Truly a hero we don't deserve. I decided that I need to play this game myself so I can give my own opinions without being influenced by others. I also wanted to see why so many people who played this game disliked it because I was just that curious. Instead of playing all these hot new games of 2023, I instead chose to spend my time with various day life. Yes, I was that curious. And no, I wasn't just gonna play two hours of the game and call it there. I wanted to go all the way until the game was complete and finished. I will go over as much as I can from the gameplay, music, and the story, which is actually, uh, well, 
You'll find out as you keep watching. And of course, there will be spoilers for this game, so please keep that in mind. But honest to God, I find it very hard for many people to even get as far as I did in this game, let alone buying it. So, just how good is Various Day Life? Here we go. First off, the music is pretty good. You really can't go wrong with that already. What past me doesn't realize is that this is where the game stops being good. I don't really bother to mess around with the controls or anything because it seems like it's a turn-based game, so I don't really need massive changes unless the controls are really that cumbersome to me. The character customization comes down to just one male character with three different variations. I'm sorry to all the women enjoyers out there. Other than that, a name can be chosen and you're just ready to start. Not much customization which sucks, but it's not at a point of contention where it's like, this game is awful already in my opinion. Now this game is quirky in the fact that it has like basically gibberish as their language. Language. It, I thought it was Japanese, I thought it was some kind of weird mixture or something, but it's just one of those like Monster Hunter gibberish language type things. We've arrived in the world of Antoesha in the city of Arabia, which will be our new home for us, the new settlers of the Seventh Fleet. We open up to Prince Alfred talking to another character who was unnamed at the moment. Prince Alfred talks about his goals of opening up the continent and eventually his ambitions will be realized. Totally not foreshadow at all. Now, going back to our character, we're greeted off of our ship by a cute blonde night woman. Ugh, my kind of women. Her name is Adelaide Cheval, a knight who is sworn to protect the people of Antuisha. We are then finally able to move around, and honestly, I think it's kind of cute how they have it this way of moving around an area in an endless loop. This charm soon wears off after a few hours of gameplay, however, so... Get cozy. Moving from the port into the city, we meet Gilda, who greets us as a secretary of the guild. And then we meet her boss, the director. Oh my gosh, so many cute women in this game. After doing a little quick questionnaire about our origins, it'll throw us some points into the respective stats. Honestly, this will be little of help because you can easily gain stats and lose them just as quickly later on in the game. Soon after, we meet Melhard, a kind of melancholy looking priest man, and then we meet Bruno, our first real ally, big huggable bear looking man. We then heard the tragic news about how the state will not be covering our day to day, so that means we must go get money by working. Bruno gives us our first job, the warrior job, and we can finally begin our work task, which is one of the features that this game is really proud of telling us about and our first ever job is wolf control and it and it's all wolf control okay you know what it's a start we go to control some wolves so then we head out of the room and then come right back home after a few hours and we we didn't get to fight the wolves at all wait th that was it is this not a jrpg like what's going on here what welcome to the work task of various day life and no not jobs as in the class that you play, but work. If at any point I mix up the words job and work, I am just so sorry. This is essentially the extent of how exciting the work tasks are. You pick a task and there's a chance it will fail or you have an accident occur, your character walks out, walks back in, and you are rewarded with stats and money. If you played this game enough, which you still have a chance to leave, don't even continue. You may notice that your character has two different celebration victory emotes when he completes a job. One is a standard, yeah, I did it, while the other is an excellent job type reward where you'll actually receive three times the amount of money that was listed for the job. Now, how does one receive the three time money reward? Well, it happens randomly as far as I can tell, so good luck. The more jobs you complete, the more you'll increase your work chain bonus, which allows for your EXP to be multiplied as you do jobs. The multiplier cap starts off at 1.5 times, but eventually moves up to 10 times in the late game. And the cap only raises when you made significant progress in the main story. Now, you may notice that your stats will either increase or decrease depending on your task. Keep an eye on the day bonus because this will actually multiply the amount of stats that you get, which either could increase massively or decrease massively. Also, for any future abilities that you want to receive for a new job, you have to do it through the work task. You'll have to complete the right work task that's related to the new job, and that's how you receive your new abilities. It does take a bit of time and a cutscene or two to finally unlock a new work task for that job, but that will hopefully unlock a new skill for you. Are you still following me? Yeah, because this is where it gets kind of confusing for the most part. The constant moving around the menus during the work task is such a tedious thing to do, and it got tiring really quickly. This is how you'll be making 
making a majority of your income for this game. And yes, while you do gain a bit of stats from doing work tasks, this effectively becomes so slow when compared to a new mechanic introduced later in the game that I call the stat trainers. Not only is this the majority of how you make your money, but this is the majority of how you'll spend a good 90% of your gameplay in. And I am not exaggerating on this. I am being completely honest. And as you can tell, the more you do work tasks, the more that your stamina and your mood bar will go down. So how does one replenish your stamina and your mood bar? Well, it seems tempting to take a rest, but this is actually the worst possible option as you will lose your work chain bonus. Resting also only recovers your stamina bar and not your mood bar. Later on, the best way to recover your stamina and or your mood bar is by actually hanging out with your allies because this also increases your affinity and your bond with them. That aside, the work task system of this game is simply one of the most boringest things I've ever played in an RPG-like game. I'd rather have the classic mechanics of just walking around an open world and fighting random encounters. It's just literally menu the gameplay. Later on, we do unlock better job... <laughs> Sorry. We do unlock better work that gives us more money, but holy cow, it takes forever to get the better jobs. Sorry, work. Oh my gosh. But unlocking those things isn't until much later in the game. Funny enough, you may realize there is indeed a time and date feature in this game, and time does actually progress as you keep playing with no restriction, it seems. I wouldn't doubt if this game's year actually goes past the 1000th mark. You can, from what I can tell, play this game almost infinitely, uh, which I really don't recommend for anybody to do that. As the years keep going and time passes, your characters, all of them, stay the same age and almost never look any older as you keep playing. <clears throat> Well, this is actually integral to the plot of the story, so I'll explain all of this much later, but for now, just enjoy the game for what it is. And by that, I mean just enjoy watching me talk about this game, because I highly advise you don't play this game yourself. Also, respect the stamina and mood bar. If those bars are low, they affect your accident and your failure rate respectively for work. Failing a work task isn't the worst thing ever because you just simply fail it, you won't get all your money, and you still keep your work chain bonus. Not the worst thing ever. However, accidents are far more worse. The reason is because if you have an accident on a work task, your character will just simply collapse, which seems really funny at first. But then your character is bedridden for the next few days, and you are rapidly losing the stats that you worked so hard in the early game to raise. Yeah, not funny at all. Oh, I do want to point out that you actually don't go down in levels, you just lose the progress that you're making onto the next level of a stat. Not too long from when we got the work task system, we are then introduced to the Expeditions, which is essentially where all the RPG-like elements take place in this game. We decide to join Bruno and his Down on His Luck guild to work to make his guild a more respectable one and one that contributes to the exploration of Intuitia. We meet his sickly, not biological sister, Willa. They've been together as practically orphans and their bond is as strong if not stronger than blood. I feel really bad for her because she is always just sick throughout the game. I'm also really upset we can't get Willa as a party member because well I mean we, we had wheelchair combat in Fear and Hunger, so why not here? Bruno is basically taking care of Willa as much as he can, and us helping him will effectively help her, so let's just go ahead and join the guild and help them out. After joining the guild, we now go to the tavern to celebrate. Here we meet Gilda again and her friend Ethel, a tavern waitress. Ethel is your very optimistic girl who's had a very much different background when compared to the other colonists. She was actually found in these lands without her memories. Totally not strange and foreshadowing at anything at all. Both Gilda and Ethel express interest in joining our guild to round out our party, and this will be our starting party of the game. Two warriors, a secretary, and a waitress. You, you know, there's, there's nothing wrong with it. It's just a super surprising composition for an RPG, in my opinion. We now have quests or expeditions unlock, and I will use these terms interchangeably because they're pretty much the same thing. I also really find it funny how they encourage you to save as much as you can so you can save scum in case things go horribly wrong. Now we're finally on a quest. Let's go on an adventure. Let's go. We're, wait, we're not actually even doing the moving. It's just a straight shot with you having only control over the menu and fast forward button. Yep, this is it. This is the real quote unquote gameplay of various day life. Oh man, I, I really want to come to this game with an open mind, but... <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm slowly just being more disappointed every time I keep playing. Finally, we have our first taste of battle in this game, and it's your classic turn-based battling, and we have our classic abilities. We have warriors with their big, strong slashes and everything, uh, secretary abilities. I, I didn't know secretaries have fire and thunder magic. I will note here one of my favorite things about this game is the status effects that you can put on the enemies. Most games usually encourage you to use your strongest abilities and just throw them at the enemies instead of applying status effects to them. However, with various day life, it's actually a core mechanic of the game. When an enemy is aflame, which is basically a burn onto them, hitting them with a melee attack will actually have the fires jump onto you as well. And of course, you know, I had to just mess around and find out and well, I do commend them for making such an interesting feature. Other status effects include things like Soak, which makes it so the enemy's evasion drops drastically. When electrified, there's a chance that you may be unable to move, and of course, if you hit the enemy while they're also electrified, you will actually get that yourself. Dazing someone will make it so they can't attack, but also attacks are guaranteed, and I really enjoy it when games make the status effects a fun part of the game. And this all plays into the game's hit battle feature, the Cha system. The three Cha system being Change, Chain, and Chance. And they go in that order, starting with Change, which means to change the enemy status, so let's say Soak, Burn, Electrify them, and so on. This will kick off all the attacks that you'll need to do in order to have a big payoff of damage at the end. Chain means to essentially keep attacking the enemies to build up a large chain bonus, which eventually blows up at the end with Chance. Chance is the big finale where you finish off the change, and depending how far you went, with the chain bonus, you'll do massive amounts of damage. This was all really interesting in concept, but once you realize it's simply you having to press whatever highlighted thing came up, it became stupidly simple. I also noticed my MP was not going down during the fights at all. This was because during the tutorial, they lure you into thinking that you can easily spam stuff. Oh no, wait till we get to the real game. It does not work like that. And this is essentially... The game. We just travel with an occasional battle. This doesn't have the same kind of experience as you would exploring a cave or going where you wish to go in a traditional RPG. Instead, we're just stuck with watching our characters go in a straight line. For now, the beginning expeditions are this simple. We do get a bit more things that spice it up a bit, but this is essentially it. We finally reach the end of the level and we encounter this really weird pillar looking thing. We hear a bit more about the world of Antuisha and how there lived a previous civilization before the colonists came. Ethel gets near the pillar and it activates, I guess, its defense system? And also, really weird how she gets near the pillar and it like suddenly activates, I don't know, foreshadow? Probably not. And now begins our first boss battle of the game, this tanky golem looking enemy. Examining him, we find out that he has 400 HP! Prior to this battle, every single fight we were doing, we were dealing around like the single digits and we weren't really doing that much damage, so we're probably gonna be in for a long fight. This battle was actually really fun because this was actually the first time where you actually had to utilize the Cha system really effectively to make the most out of it. Lowering the boss's evasion through soaks with Ethel's ability and then following up with Bruno's stun made it so easy to stunlock this boss. And I'm not gonna lie, it's actually really satisfying when you start connecting all your moves together properly. After defeating the boss, we see that the water nearby is reflecting the city, uh, and we decide to step in and we're back in Arabia. But don't get too excited, this doesn't really open up fast traveling as an option in the game yet. This is more of just like plot device stuff. And at this point, you can pretty much surmise what's going to happen for the rest of the game. We do work task for some money and some skill EXP. We then hang out with our friends to raise our affinity, which costs money. Train our allies to raise their level and stats, also money. This is the only way to raise your ally stats outside of equipment, which also that costs money as well. And then once you're confident enough, you can now go on expeditions to progress in the main story, which doesn't really cost money, but you do need the items to keep your characters topped off, so therefore it technically does require money. And after completing a long expedition, you can finally then progress with the game and do it all over again for the next stage of the game. There is this weird gossip rumor system in the game, Honestly, it's really forgettable, and I didn't really bother using it too much. I did mention this earlier, but yeah, you can take your allies on dates to improve their affinity a little bit. There technically isn't a real romance system in the game, but you can become partners with any of your companions, which does affect your ending just slightly, where you get like a little small little scene at the end with them, and that's pretty much it. It doesn't really affect the story that much. It's nothing like Fire Emblem S ranking, but like, it's a nice way to let you know you really bonded with the character that you really enjoyed being around. When you partnered with somebody, you make 
make their special attack even stronger, and that's really it. <laughs> There's not much to it, so they don't really get much extra stats or anything, and you can only have one partner at a time. At one point in the game, I accidentally partnered with Bruno, and he just jump scared me in my own room. Jesus, Bruno, don't do that. Now, the game doesn't really explicitly tell you this, but to get your new job, you have to kind of just wait until a job respective character comes up to you telling you, hey, it's so great to be a secretary or something. This comes seemingly at random, but honestly, you just gotta wait a few days before that character comes up to you. And of course, the best part is with the new jobs comes new work, which means more money, but at the moment, it's it's all still Bruno. The new set of work actually doesn't roll in until every Monday, so you shouldn't expect anything until the next week rolls around. Now, the next expedition is our first real expedition, and it tells us to bring food. But wait until we're inside the quest to tell us that there's a food-spoiling mechanic. I do want to mention that you do have a limited amount of space for your food and your items for expeditions. I would appreciate it much more if the game told me there was a food expiring thing before I walked into the quest so that way I didn't have to bring in too much food that could potentially expire, rendering it useless for later runs. And now that we're finally out of the tutorial, we can finally experience the real tough part of the game and wait, wait, my max HP is draining? This is why we have food, so that way you can restore your max HP that falls while you're walking around in your expedition. And if that max HP falls to zero, you will wipe and you fail your expedition. Nothing hurts more than getting so far in an expedition only to realize you did not prep properly and you just lose because you did not have the food to back it up. And now that we're out of the tutorial, now we finally have our mana being expended when we use spells. To make matters worse for myself, I swapped to the secretary job because, you know, I wanted to use all the cool AoE hitting spells, but I didn't have any abilities. Yeah, remember earlier when I talked about how you get new jobs that unlock new work tasks? Well, you have to do those new work tasks to unlock new abilities for that said job. Just swapping to the new job will have nothing on it. So for this expedition, my main guy just sat there auto-attacking the whole time because... Well, honestly, I was just way too lazy to leave at this point. I pretty much did not come prepared for my first ever expedition to the point where everybody was running out of mana and they just had to auto every single enemy they saw. Once the expedition was finished, I finally went back to the city and got the new abilities for my secretary job. Now, as I stated earlier, you can get stats from doing work tasks, but holy cow, is it slow and monotonous. You're gonna spend so much time trying to increase one stat and you have to get it right or else you're gonna lose points in that stat with the wrong work task. You do work to get money and stats, but you can't do it for too long or else your mood and your stamina bar goes down. So you'll need to replenish it with a not dating mechanic by going out with your teammates. You hunt down your favorite teammate that you want to go on a date with and you go out with them. This also increases your stat a little bit depending on what you're doing, but just just barely. Replenish your mood and your stamina and then you repeat until you're finally confident enough to take on the next expedition. Eventually, you will find people that I call trainers who will give you a significant increase in a desired stat, but that is if you have the money for it. You can train some of your intelligence at Willa's Course in Magic, which costs 100k, but you know what? She can't really go on expedition, so she's got to make money somehow. Later on, you will find other NPCs who will train certain stats in other areas that Willa cannot, but of course, that's for even more money as well. All of that was for your own stats, but for the rest of your group, you can only raise their stats through the train ally option, where it increases all of their stats for a fee, and the fee grows as one may can tell. Like, for some odd reason, at certain milestone levels, like let's say 10, 15, 20, it goes from a few several thousand to like almost 50k when you get to those marks. But then after you pay for that milestone level, it goes back to being more affordable. I, I, I don't know why it does this. And money is literally the king in this game and it's just unfortunate. It's just a money grind. You really can't use combat to grind the rest of your team to being good so you're just stuck there having to grind the work task to get more money to spend on your allies to make them stronger. And money gets really annoying fast when you realize you have to spend 200k to upgrade the armory for even better equipment sometimes. And that can also climb up to almost 1 million to upgrade the equipment and don't forget the item store which also needs an upgrade fee as well if you want to get better items for your expeditions. And I guess while we're on the subject of money, the game will literally gate your progress because you have to build a bridge for 500k. Money is just everywhere in this game and it's just too much. Earlier I mentioned how it's so cute to kind of walk around town. Well, that gets annoying really quickly when you just want to talk to somebody else who's on another part of town that you want to talk to that isn't Bruno who's hanging outside of your home. Sorry, Bruno. I just want to go talk to Gilda instead. I'm sorry. There is no fast travel in the early game, and that doesn't come until a few hours when you're into the game. You just have to run to one side until you can finally unlock fast traveling. In fact, I did not unlock fast travel in the town until I was about 7 hours and 40 minutes 
in. Also, Bruno is looking really blurry in this cutscene. I, I don't know why. I just want to point that out. Now, expeditions are really only ever there to offer you story progression. This isn't really a EXP or money maker. And believe me, I, I really tried. The server or waiter job basically has a steal money attack, but that only gets you peanuts. There's a chance for you to get something called checks, I believe that's how you say it. And when this is sold, it nets you a good chunk of money, but that's almost really rare to get. And in the time that you spent trying to get one, you could have just done the work task instead. Oh, once you complete an expedition, by the way, you cannot repeat it to gain more money. When you repeat an expedition, you mainly do it for the potential item drops or the thrill of running it back, which I cannot really imagine people wanting to run it back for no reason. Early game expeditions last for a few short days, but the late games feels like a whole struggle trying to get past five to seven days and you gotta pray you brought the right resources along or you will be kicking yourselves in the back. Later expeditions require you to bring good food or else you will find yourself having to leave the quest early because you didn't bring the right resources or you'll just end up wiping if your HP reaches zero. Also it's important to know that some side expeditions are kind of time sensitive requiring you to go at a certain time to find a certain enemy that's only available at a certain time of the day or for a certain item to drop. And if you just don't get that item then you're just unlucky and you fail. Sorry. Also a really minor annoyance I had was with the description of the incense item. Incense is a full HP and MP recovery item when you're resting at a camp. But I'm just not sure why they didn't just say that in the description of the item because the description reads, Incense to keep monsters at bay while sleeping in camp. See, this made me thought it was some kind of repellent for battles. And when you heal up using an incense, it only heals you up to your max HP. So whatever you lost during your expedition that you did not eat to recover, you don't heal back. Meaning you have to eat before you use your incense. Once you get an idea of playing this game, you soon realize that after grinding all your work tasks, your main character becomes really over level compared to the rest of your team. My guy was level 13 while everyone else was below 10 and training everybody evenly would be so costly especially when I want to start buying accessories and equipment to raise their stats a little bit more as well. I noticed that one of the new expeditions I got in the early game was level recommended 8, so I thought, you know, roughly everyone was around that level, why not just give it a shot, even if they're like a level or two down. This is where I learned the game was lying to you. Because whenever you see a level recommendation, always bring people who are about, I don't know, like 5 levels above that, or even more. Later on, the game will give you missions that has level recommendations for 30, but sometimes my team that was at 60 was struggling, and I will highlight more on this later in the video. I started training Melhard as he was our only healer and dropped Bruno in favor of a magic-centric team. I was able to one-shot most enemies, making this a breeze up until I found the boss, and it was a lot of rats. Although I was able to take out a good number of his team, he took down most of my team as well. One level slash took out my entire team, and for the most part, Melhard's healing was not good. I barely got away with the win, but oh my god, is this game hard at times. We finally made some progress in the story, and the higher-ups in the palace are happy with our results. Yay! Until Ulfric does that weird talking to himself scene, and then it kind of slowly hints at him not being a great guy. Wow, big surprise. At this point in the game, we finally unlock the work list refresh, which allows us to change out our work task if we didn't like it. And hooray! We finally got the fast travel option in the town! Only took me 7 hours and 24 minutes. Lovely. And it took me so many hours to make any significant progress on the story. This whole game is pretty much grinding your ass off just for a few mere minutes of seeing more of the story. Now if you notice, we start off with a pretty empty map of the continent that we need to progress and mark down as we march into new territory. The jungle being the second area of the game, and then we have the marsh after, and so on. Each area has a different climate and temperature, so it's wise to bring the appropriate food for each place you're going to, or else your food will spoil really quickly. Sometimes new expeditions may have you going back to old areas to collect items that help you combat the new ones, such as going back to collect materials for a coat so you can deal with the cold temperatures of the new areas. Or getting horses so that way you can cross over certain lands better, but that doesn't really mean you can use horses for every single area, just mainly just one specific area. Other than the new visual areas and the new enemies you fight, everything else is pretty much largely the same. The music does change depending on where you're at, but other than that, there's not much change to new areas, and it makes it less exciting every time you cross to a new place. In terms of variation though, there are at least 20 different jobs in the game, but your main character is the only one who can use any job they want. The biggest problem with this is the fact that the rest of your team is stuck with three different jobs and cannot change out of those jobs under any circumstances, but the upside is that they can at least use all the skills of every job that they have at any moment. Meaning you can never have Bruno become a secretary or Gilda become a warrior. Each character can have a main job and two other side jobs, and I did not encounter my first side job 
for a character until nearly 9 plus hours into the game. New jobs can be attained through the new job tabs for certain expeditions. It does take a bit of time to finally unlock all these different side jobs. I finally unlocked the dancer job for Ephel, which is actually much stronger than her previous job, and that's something that you'll notice that's a big problem right away. Pretty much there is a job creep in this game, and you'll see the older jobs having pretty much almost no viability later on the game when compared to the new ones that you'll get. Warriors will be complete ass because they come equipped with skills like Level Slash, a weak attack that hits everyone in the enemy team, and there's no way to upgrade skills like this. Later on, these new jobs will also give you new work tasks that will award you with way more money, like around 20k to 50k usually. While it does help you with the money grind, it's still boring and tedious to do. Some jobs, such as Gilda's Hunter job, will actually have a passive ability to use during expeditions. The Hunter's passive allows you to gather food during an expedition, which can be actually really helpful. To gather the food, however, you need to press the corresponding arrow that appears above her head, depending on where she's at in the party. But if you're not fast enough, the arrow will disappear, but you can counteract this by literally spamming the arrow key of where she's at. I'll go ahead and mention all the jobs that everyone gets here, starting with Bruno, who gets Warrior, Herbalist, and Shaman, Gilda with Hunter, Secretary, and Merchant, Ephil with Server, Dancer, and Beast Tamer, Melhard gets Servite, Fisher, and Sylph Spear, Adelaide gets Knight, Cleric, and Paladin, which really fits her line, honestly, it complements her really well. Ruben gets Taylor, Courier, and then Metalsmith, Orion gets Salaban Sword, Executioner, and then Sauna Meister, yeah, that's correct, Sauna Meister. Fana gets Cook, Ludist, and Politician. She she has quite the job line. <laughs> and finally, Roselta gets Scholar, Sorcerer, and Spellfencer. And actually, contrary to what I said earlier, Spellfencer is probably the worst job yet. And because of the other new jobs being better than the old ones, I had to bench Melhard's bad healing for Bruno's single target healing, which was way better. But of course, that meant going back once more to level up Bruno because he was far behind on everybody's level, and that just took a bit more time. Which brings me to my next problem of the game. I know, I have a lot. I'm so sorry. You have to level up everyone slowly and individually. And you'll have to bench some people in order to make some time to progress with the story faster unless you really want to go back and level up everybody to make sure they're on par with everyone. But man, I highly recommend you just pick a few people you like and just stick with them. Because as I said earlier, once you progress more with the story, you unlock new jobs, which mean more work tasks that awards you with way more money than you would have trying to grind the other jobs back in the early game. And also, it was just really hard to justify keeping Melhard in the group because of his weak party-wide heal and his weak sleep AoE attack. And I really wish there was some way to keep the rest of your party on level without having to do all the grinding because as you can see, some people got left in the dust with levels only to come back later on when they're more relevant when they have a brand new job that is way better than what you had earlier. And like I said earlier, the level recommendation for Expedition is a utter lie. If I was having a bit of trouble on Expedition that said, hey, you should be at this level when I was already 20 levels up, then I cannot really fathom the idea of people doing it at the level at which the game recommends. And oh boy, I do have a great example of this coming up soon. Okay, okay, I know I've been really harsh and really harping about the bad things about this game, but I want to take a second to actually appreciate some of the good aspects of various day life. Yes, it does have some good aspects. I do want to highlight that the characters and the dialogue are actually delightful and fun to read. They're not a boring cast and they actually make this game a bit more fun to go through a bit. Once again, a, a bit. Like, I actually felt really bad for Bruno for losing some of his old members from his expedition crew. And the key relationship between Gilda and Ethel and how much they care about each other. Ethel recounts a time about how Gilda had to give her a bath and feed her, which you know, I, I, I like that deal as well, Gilda, please. But as you progress through the game, you'll notice how much they care for one another as if they were true friends, and it's really touching. But that's just among all the characters, really. You feel this bond between one another, and I, I get this warm feeling inside me. I know it sounds kind of cheesy, but... It's a cute crew, I like it. And one of my favorite dialogues of the game is when you unlock Bruno's herbalist job. A lot of the herbalist work tasks are medical related. And during your first physical examination cutscene, Bruno has to give a waitress a physical examination, but instead, she'd rather have us do it while blushing, which is, I thought was kind of funny. Also, rip Bruno, I'm so sorry, man. There were many moments in the game where it really made me feel like I almost forgot about how painful it was playing through the game. Almost. The characters are well written enough for you to care about them. Bruno is this helpful, loving brother to Willa, and he will do just about anything to make sure she's okay. Which was one of his motivations for actually picking up the herbalist job. Gilda being the workaholic who needs to learn how to relax but has a crazy appetite for food. And Ethel being the opposite to Gilda, providing her with the much needed relaxation that she needs and also being her good friend. Also, Ethel has some really mysterious origins, and that actually plays into the story, which we'll talk about all about the story in the next few sections. Melhar being this priest who also loves 
alcohol on the people of Arabia, but also learns his place in the world and how he's this guiding figure for people who are lost. Adelaide being the strong and brave knight character who protects people, but also wants to learn how to be more ladylike so she can kind of come off more friendlier. Also, her ultimate animation is really cute when we give her the little fist pound and then she just blushes after. It's, a, it's adorable. Rubens? Okay, well, he's the son of the blacksmith. He loves money. All right, I'll admit, I didn't really pay too much attention to Rubens because when I got him, it was at a point of when I just wanted to really move on with the game and I didn't really pay too much attention. It was just spamming through his story. I'm so sorry, Rubens, but I'm sure he's a great guy. Fana being your dreamer character who wishes to do more good for the world than just provide delicious meals as a chef. And also, her flex from going from being a simple chef to a politician is a really impressive thing, and in a short time, actually. Orion is your resident grandpa-like character with a man full of regrets of his dark past and only wishes to right his wrongs. He once had a son and a wife in his life, but now they're gone, and it's a really tragic story for Orion. And Roselta, oh my god. I love her so much, and other than being the playful and smart character of the crew, she ended up being my partner of the game. Which is really funny, because I started partnering off with Gilda first, and I almost swapped over to Adelaide, but I got super lazy and didn't want to do her partner quest. And by that point in the game, I already unlocked Roselta, and I insta-partnered her right away. I literally romanced my ex-partner's body. Boss. I'm so sorry, Gilda, but Roselta's just, ooh! And let me just reiterate that I know this cast of characters isn't like the most groundbreakingly well-written characters in history of storytelling, but it's a nice cast of characters that are unique from one another that brings their own style to make the party more livelier. And the music of this game has no business being as good as it was for a game like this. The combat music has some of the most energetic pieces that put you right back into the action after a droning walk through an expedition. Okay, but really though, the expedition music is a really really solid adventure track that gets you right into the mood when you're marching through to your next destination. But for me, the music really shine when you're just walking around the town. The music actually changes depending on which part of town that you are in. The peaceful town music is what really made me kind of forget about the game's bad for a bit, and just made me realize that this game isn't terrible per se. One of my absolute favorite tracks of the game is Kindness is Always There, which plays when you share a moment with your favorite NPC, and it's just so touching. The music really made me feel nostalgia for games like Pokemon Emerald when I was a kid, when life was just carefree and relaxing. Now that we've talked about the good of the game, we need to get back to the reality of it, and we need to talk about the most important aspect of the game, the story. The entire story boils down to this. Hey, we need you to explore the uncharted lands over there. Great, you've been to the new area already? Well then we need you to massacre the beast tribe people that live there because, you know, we need to make it safe for the other travelers out there. And then you move on to the next area and the one after that while uncovering a bit of the story slowly and trying to figure out what the hell is going on with those pillars of fast traveling. And as we keep clearing the continent, we also start making maps for other guilds so they can start navigating the world themselves and help them in their own journeys. Our guild is truly making a difference in the world and it actually feels great to be the spearheads of the explorers of the new world. And the reason why we're at the forefront of all this is because our group is the only one capable of activating these fast traveling pillars. Weird, as if somebody in our group can do that for some odd reason that we don't know about. After defeating the final beast tribe, we've successfully searched out the new world. We are then brought up to Prince Ulfric's grand balcony to address the crowd and he presents us with the highest honors and thanks us for our hard work. The townspeople are happy for us and it brings Gilda to tears because she isn't used to all this praise and the team gathers around to comfort her. We get this little cute art piece with everybody together, and then the credits roll. You know, when thinking about it, this game was quite a journey, but it wasn't a complete mess. Like, it could have been much better. And wait, what's going on? Why is there more cutscenes? <sighs> and it's not over yet. This is one of those infamous video game fake-out endings where you have to reload the save and see what happens next. You see, as we kept going out further into the continent and making it safer for everyone else, we were occasionally giving cutscenes of Prince Ulfric talking to his henchmen from time to time, eventually learning about his plot to finding something called World From. And we have no idea what the hell this thing is or why he wants to keep it under wraps as much as possible. After our celebration of conquering the continent, Prince Ulfric turns to his henchman and tells him that he really doesn't care about all the progress that our guild made, asshole, and that essentially we're pawns in his grand scheme. Ulfric then begins his move to find this world from and refers to it as a her. We're brought back to the save screen, then the title screen, only to pretty much learn that there's still more to this game. I thought we were done. I thought this nightmare was over, but nope, we're still back at it. Loading up your save once more, it'll bring you to the summary of what's happened since our victory over exploring the continent. The idea of wanting to cultivate the lands for riches has yet started. The palace issued many orders to force people into expeditions outside of the city with many losses piling up. And despite the beast man threat being neutralized, there have been countless colonists who have never returned home. The palace has made any exchange with the old country 
country difficult, and even something as sending a letter home as a headache-inducing process. The dream of what seemed to be a promising land of opportunity soon diminished with each passing day. And this... This is where the plot actually gets a bit more interesting. After nearly 26 hours of play. Alright, we have some new quests to unlock, so let's go check them out. My units are so overleveled to the point where I believe I don't need to grind any further to get through the content, so let's just go ahead and give it a whirl. The newest main quest is about Melhard's urgent request, and oh my goodness! They want me to bring Melhard, Adelaide, and Fana. Now, why is this a problem? Well, you see, Melhard is literally level 13, and Fana is sitting at 23 when I first recruited her, never using her much at all. This is perhaps one of the stupidest parts of the game because if you happen to have none of these characters leveled up, then you will struggle. Now, 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 before you start saying something about how this isn't stupid, please sit there. I will counteract this later with an example, so sit tight and hold that comment, please. This part of the game is only the start of the headaches that I'll be getting. This quest is actually about how Fana found out about a group of colonists who are plotting to assassinate the prince. Very valid, I understand. This is revenge for Osera, a friend to many in the town who has gone missing and they believe the prince has had a hand in this matter. But Osera isn't the only person that's gone missing, but many other colonists as well. So it's on us to stop this plot from ever occurring, so that way we can prevent any more unneeded loss. So I said screw it, my MC and Adelaide, who was lucky enough to be one of my core members that I kept level throughout the whole game, they were both at a high level that I thought they could probably carry the rest of the group, Melhard and Fana, so I decided let's let's give it a try. I also want to note something. Attacks outside of a chance cannot hit over a 999. In the late game, you cannot simply one-hit kill mooks. You'll need at least a turn or two to completely knock out all the enemies. And once again, if you are not over that recommended level, I honestly cannot see you getting through the fights as easily as I could have. Overall, the expedition wasn't too bad. Adelaide and I carried the hardest, and Melhar just kind of soaked a lot of damage. We finally found the group of assassins and tried to stop them from doing their plan. The assassins state that the palace doesn't even try to find these missing people, or even care at all. The assassins have lost a lot of friends, families, and loved ones, and they only want justice for them. Things get a bit heated in the room, and everyone's getting angry, and Fana pulls out her loot to quell the anger by playing it. Kinda cheesy, but whatever. And it does actually stop everyone from fighting with one another in the room. This brings a small bit of peace that is broken up once the palace men have appeared to be aware of the plot and he had to break up the meeting and end it all. Apprehending the would-be assassins and putting an end to their plot before it even began. Oh, cute victory music. We did it! But our victory is cut short as the people who were captured were sent to death almost immediately upon return. Jesus. Adelaide attempts to change the prince's mind, but he does not budge at all. The assassins were swiftly executed, and this only led to more distrust and unrest amongst everyone in the city. All of these events inspire Adelaide to take up the position of becoming a paladin, a knight who is sworn to protect the people first from anyone who would threaten them, even the palace. And you know, call me crazy, but I actually started thinking the story was getting really good at this point. Maybe the political stuff really speaks to me? I don't know. I just like it. We're given the next main quest, which is to go investigate the volcano region of the game. And surprise! Surprise, we have to bring yet again Melhard, Adelaide, and Fana. I wanted to cry. I decided to take this time to grind because, you know, the enemies are getting a bit harder and I wanted a smoother ride trying to get to the end of this level. And if you think for a second that there shouldn't be much grinding at this stage in the game, well, you're wrong. There will always be equipment to gather so you can make your people even stronger, or even new jobs to collect so you make sure everyone else in your party is as strong as possible for the upcoming expeditions. And the gameplay loop at this point is still pretty much the same as it always been. Just grind work tasks for more money and spend the money. And after grinding out some people's levels, we finally decided to take on the next quest. Earlier in the game, we were stopped by the palace men from a certain area in the volcanic region, so we're gonna go investigate that. And I do want to point out once again that the level recommendation for this mission was like 39 Nine, while everybody else was above 40 at this point, and Fana was barely doing any damage at all. Like, literally, Adelaide and I were caring the whole time. At the end of the expedition, we discovered the truth about the area that we were so curious about. It's a corpse disposal area, and this is where all the missing people were taken to. And nearby, we find Osera's belongings, which heavily hints at the fact that she was tossed into the lava as well. Yikes. And just to kind of spoil you guys a little bit, we never see Osera ever again in the game, so she's gone. And the palace men do not operate unless the prince tells them to do so, so that means all of this points to the prince having a hand at all of this, but we need a strong evidence to prove it all. The next main quest 
Celeste is in the mountains, but without Orion in our party, which is a damn shame because he's actually one of my core members that I leveled up, so god damn it. Only Melhar is required so the other two spots are flexible, but am I regretting it so hard that I didn't level him up. We are here in the mountains to investigate a person who's connected to the top of the palace but does not work as a normal soldier. That said person is also being targeted and hunted down by the palace men, so we need to get to him first before he's compromised. And even though I had three-fourths of my core team, the enemies at this level were still hitting me hard, and everyone was like around 50, and the level recommendation was 38. And after a long, painstaking journey, this expedition that took nearly 16 minutes, we finally get to the end to meet our man. And there he was. Someone that we actually never met before in the game. A horrific and scarred looking man with a frightening appearance dressed in all black. He seemed out of his mind and would not listen to reason. He only knows killing and that was his life's work. And that brings us to our first battle against a human being, this question mark man. He hurts, but luckily I came over prepared and ready to take him down. And really, I cannot understand playing this game without being over leveled. How do people do it? Now, if you can recall earlier before we started this mission, we could not bring Orion into our party. There's a reason for that. This man is Colio, Orion's son. Orion brings an end to Colio by killing his own son. Colio was an executioner for the crown, meaning he'll assassinate anybody who they tell him to. Nearby, we find Colio's safe house, where we find his journal of him logging all the deeds he's done for the palace. Colio was responsible for everyone that went missing. And although he was the one who committed the crime, he was only following orders from Prince Ulfric. Now that we have some hard evidence, this makes it easier to convict Prince Ulfric. Orion then takes up the mantle of being the executioner once more as he did in the past, which is kind of sad because he was the previous executioner before Colio. Just when he thought he can escape his past of all the dark deeds he's done, he's pulled right back in indirectly by Prince Ulfric. And now we have unlocked a new area to explore, Arabia, our own home city. This is it. To finally confront the prince and his men. And because the recommended level is 39, I can easily take this on, right? Right? Adelaide leads the charge in the revolt against Prince Ulfric, and Orion, a former Hand of the Prince, now joins our cause to fight back the Mad Prince. It's the people versus the crown, and we will bring the prince to justice for his crimes. The only thing between us and Ulfric is his own men, and we're not about to let that stop us. And thus begins the march to the end. The music for this march is so good, it actually got me pumped to keep going. We encounter our first battle, and it's with... 4,000 HP soldiers? Excuse me? Everything before this was like between 1k to 2k, but now we have a sudden leap in HP? The enemy is just composed of these two guys, the Sylph Sphere and the Salaman Sword. On top of being tanky, they also hit relatively hard. And admittedly, I did not prep well for this trip, and I could have been way more better with my item management, but you know what? We progress anyways. The music was perfect for storming the castle, and I really want to put an end to this prince's mess. Unfortunately for for me, I used up all my resources when I reached the prince and I was less than max health HP. But you know what, we made it this far and it took practically 20 minutes just to get to this boss so I decided I might as well just try and fight him. Upon reaching Ulfric, he doesn't wish to stand down and he stands by his mentality of just using everyone as a tool for himself. He has no love for the people of the city and sends his soldiers out to go kill anyone who defies him. Adelaide and our group won't relent and we will stand here and fight him. Ulfric comes with two additional units but they're nothing special, they're just the same guys we fought before. And Ulfric himself is an annoying boss because he can buff his attack and defense. I take out his ad so there's less of a threat on his side and it was on to the man himself. With the boss music blasting and the drive to end this mad prince's ways, I was more motivated than ever to stop him. And finally, with my fire hammer, I strike him one last time and Ulfric was defeated. And then he rises? Uh, huh? Okay, well you know what? He is the final boss of the game, so they gotta make it a little bit more challenging, so two phases should be expected. Wait, and then his two adds also rise as well? Okay, you know what? Follow the same plan, defeat the adds, and then carefully whittle down his HP. I take down his Sylph Spear, and then there's only two people left to focus, and then I go for his other ad, the Salaman Sword. Now it's time to finally defeat Ulfric for the second time. Now this time I have to play it really carefully because my resources are actually going- his self spear just rised back up? What the? F okay, this is getting really dangerous because I don't really have many items left and my MP is going down. Thus, that means I can't really use my big attacks anymore. Oh no, please don't tell me his Salaman sword's also gonna get back up again. And he's back up. Alright, awesome. I dispatch both his soldiers once more, but my group is running low on HP, mana, and pretty much 
everything. And just when I thought I could maybe clinch this victory, his Salaman sword rises once more. These guys will not stay down, and they go up the full HP every time they come back up. And their attacks slowly cripple my team's HP to the point where I cannot recover anymore. Uh, and sadly, my team slowly falls to the Prince, and I was the only one left. And unfortunately, no final clutch play. I lose to him as well. I get him having a second phase to make him a bit more tougher than the other bosses that we fought in the game, but his endless amount of waves of ads that keep coming back every single time made things even more frustrating to play. And all that time spent trying to get to him was also just frustrating because I spent 20 minutes only to just fail. Okay, I've decided to take the time to go back and prep better, and when you look at my team's level prior, they were all below 60, but I got everyone above 60 after some grinding of money, equipment, and items. I got everything. I wanted to be sure this is the time we finally kill him for sure. And for those who have a keen eye, if you compare the dates of when I first fought Alfred to the footage now, you'll notice it's been almost a whole year since I fought him. I grinded that hard, and a year in this game is a long time. This time, I entered the battle more healthy than before, which gave me a better shot at victory. And as the battle raged on, Ulfric is brought to his knees and his units were the only ones left. And after defeating his last unit, the Salaman Sword falls down and then immediately gets right back up. What? And so does Ulfric and then his other unit, the Sylph Spear. The music then changes. Ulfric then drops the Truth Bomb on us. He cannot die at all, and this is because of the curse that the continent Antoisha has on it. Ulfric then takes into account all the years we spent in the game. Yes, this detail actually comes back to us. It has been nearly eight years since my character arrived to this continent, and not once have I aged. They actually acknowledge this fact? And not just my own character, but literally everyone who's ever arrived to this continent has not changed since they first came. On top of all of that, he tells us that no one has ever really died in these lands. The only time death was ever granted to people was when Ulfric tossed people into the volcanic facility. The curse prevents death unless you decimate one's body from beyond recovery. The great continent of Antoisha effectively grants people immortality. And with that, Phase 3 begins. Regardless of this curse, my group and I were determined to stop Ulfric at all costs. Also, quick side note, I want to note that in between each phases, the fast forward option for going through the battle fast just suddenly stops and you have to turn it back on but you can only do it when it's your turn it's just annoying why did they do this it was a long fight but we finally put an end to Ulfric and then phase four starts I'm kidding no guys we're good there's no phase four Ulfric rises up once more once the battle was finally over he then gloats about he's unkillable he cannot be stopped at all but Orion steps in to finish him off completely by cutting his head off clean off his shoulders putting an end to the now late Prince Ulfric. With the prince defeated, the soldiers stand down and the citizens are saved. And hey, we get 1k for beating the quest. That's nice. Awesome. Money. Adelaide is now serving as the acting sovereign by the people of the city. Under her watch, the people of Arabia have nothing to fear anymore. It's gonna be a lot of work to bring everything back to normal, but the dream of having Antuisha be a place for all to have joy and opportunity will be back. No more oppression from Ulfric. Melhart seemingly thinks he had no place left in the continent anymore, decides to leave, but we convince him to stay to help us rebuild this country once more. When I first came to this game, I tried to come into it with an open mind. It was a slog to get through so many of the parts that you obviously don't see me grinding through that I invested, but it was so many painful hours. Various day life story was extremely dull in the beginning, but over time, it does take some time to pick up, but that took many, many hours later. Seeing the people of Antuisha being happy with their new lives and now being able to pursue the things that they always want to do is a real reward. Wait, what? What is this? Roselta calls for a meeting to discuss what the hell Ulfric was on about on the topics of curses and immortality. It appears that Ulfric was hoping to harness this curse in order to dangle the promise of immortality to others in the old country, to draw those people onto his side and help him become emperor. He was literally trying to export immortality insane. Now, despite the idea of immortality sounding really cool with the idea of not dying or aging ever, one can still be injured or ill, which means they'll suffer for all of eternity if they cannot be cured. On top of all of that, there hasn't been any newborn children of the new world. The curse prevents children from being created. So now, our new task of the game, which doesn't seem to want to end, is to finally find a way to bring this curse 
to its own end. We get some new quests, and god, I just, I just really want to end this game. Finally, we are on our way to the true, real, real ending route of this game. We have a new quest from Ephel to go investigate something relating to her dreams. For some ungodly reason, we don't need to bring Ephel for our party for this. Yeah, remember earlier when I said how dumb it was that Melhart and the rest were required and suddenly we don't have a party requirement anymore? Yeah, dumb. The dream that Ephel had was about a girl that she saw that somehow related to the ruined areas of the game. So, we go to investigate the ruins. And again, the enemies for some odd reason now have less HP than the guys at the palace making it much more easier. I don't know why, but you know what? We'll, we'll take it. Making our way to the end of the ruins, we find a projection of a mysterious girl before us. This girl right here is in fact the High Priestess Whirlfrom, a girl that Ulfric was searching for earlier in the game. And she was the one who placed the curse upon these lands. Ethel and the group wants more answers, but the girl leaves and doesn't wish to continue talking with us. The next quest has us going deeper into the ruins to find more of the girl. At the end, we find this weird device that contains a girl inside, the girl being Whirlfrom herself. Whirlfrom appears to tell us Ethel is basically another version of her, what she calls an idealized version of herself. I'll call her Whirl at this point because her name is kind of a little bit hard to say, but she possesses so many different powers and creating another version of herself is just one of many things that she can do. But once she has started the powers of immortality to everyone in the continent, she cannot dispel that herself. Back in her day, her civilization was hit by a meteor that gravely injured so many people. And because of the curse, they were unable to die to end their suffering. The ancients, being world's people, created a device called the Bio Grandes, or Bio Grands, um... I'm just gonna call them bios. The bios were essentially created to contain the curse of immortality. Whirl was shut away into the ruins to slumber forever to stop the further spread of the curse. Ulfric managed to break the seals, which is why the curse is in effect again. And we must find a way to seal the curse once more to stop it. What seems to be a simple task isn't what it appears to be because there's a caveat to this. If we happen to seal the curse again, Whirl will go back into slumber. And we find ourselves in this situation where we have to sacrifice one small girl for the sake of the world. After outliving her people, Whirl is now left alone in this new world world. To condemn her to the same fate that her people did just didn't really sit well with the rest of the group. After speaking to us, Whirl refuses to speak any further and she leaves us. After returning back home, Rosalta finally figures out what the bios are. They are the big obelisk looking thing in Arabia and found in other parts of the continent. And for the one who broke it, it was actually Rosalta herself. It's okay baby, we make mistakes. To her credit, she originally believed that these were the reason as to why the Beastmen were attacking the city, when in reality it seemed that Alfric knew what was going on and essentially lied to everybody to kickstart all the events happening and the curse returning once more. Now two problems arises. We need to figure out the sealing process, but also once we do, there's a chance that once the curse is gone, there may be a very high chance that this will affect Ethel as well, seeing as she's basically an extension of a world. And this is quite upsetting as Ethel felt like a real friend and losing her means Gilda will be losing her other half. And in such a tough world right now, we could really use Ethel's beaming optimism. So is there a way to stop the curse and also save both Ethel and Whirl? Another expedition leads to a place that Ethel has had in her dreams, which is also a place that Whirl enjoy being at. Here is where we learn more about Whirl as Ethel has memories of her, seeing as she's practically a clone of her. Whirl purposely sealed herself up so that people who were affected by the meteorite can finally be granted death instead of living in constant pain. Her people did not seal her up, this was all a choice that she made on her own. Sealing herself up left her in a state of loneliness. And as time went on, those who were not affected by the meteorite passed on their own, long before the colonists arrived. And once the seal was broken as ordered by Ulfric, she reawoken and created Ethel to let Ethel live out the life that she's always wanted to be around people and just be happy. We come back home to finally figure out a way to break the curse without sacrificing Ethel or Whirl. The ancients that live with Whirl loathe the idea of her sacrificing herself in order to save them. They worked endlessly to find a way to reawoken Whirl, but they weren't able to find a solution before their own time came to an end. Ethel was able to read some of the ancient texts that were left by the people for their research to save Whirl. We came to basically the golden route of the game where we basically can save both Whirl, Ethel, and break the curse entirely. But first, we have to talk to Whirl about this. We meet back up with Whirl and she believed that she was hated by her people and that wasn't the case at all. They loved her as much as she loved them and they worked so hard to find a solution to set her free, but they just couldn't do it within their own time. The fix was essentially to remove the magic that Whirl had by breaking the bios. The only problem after is to direct that remaining magic that she had within her. And if we did not have a proper source to channel that magic into, it would actually lead to the continent's destruction because that powerful magic would just disperse into the land leading to dangerous consequences. The ancients weren't able to 
produce a vessel that would hold all that magic, but now we have Ethel, who's a perfect candidate to hold the magic for her. This will basically leave Whirl to become a normal, non-magic girl after it's all done. Whirl wasn't convinced at first. She didn't think she deserved a normal life, but after asking her what she truly wanted, she eventually came to terms with actually wanting to live a happy life around friends, rather than live a lonely life by herself. She then agrees to help us with the plan, and now it's time to settle things. But the game legit gates you from doing the final part of the game until you obtained every single job. Now, luckily for me, I'm kind of a completionist myself. I was all set to go, but it really sucks for anybody who happened to not have all these things ready, so the game just really stops you from completing the game. We can jump straight into the final quest, save the high priestess. There are three different bio crystals at three different locations that we need to break all at the same time. You might have an idea of what's going to happen next. We need to split the entire gang into three different groups. And how are we going to break all three crystals at different parts of the continent? Well, luckily for us, World will basically be our universal walkie-talkie because she's just a magical girl that can do that. And yes, as the game does suggest, you need to separate yourselves into three different groups. Luckily, the first group that you set up has to do with the normal expedition march while the other two don't have to do that. Now, if you may recall, everybody in my roster is not exactly leveled up all the way. But I decided, you know what? Why not just try it? Let's see how hard my MC can carry seeing as he's present in every single group somehow, at every different location. The final expedition, and oh my god, it feels so great to finally say that. And for this expedition, every single wave of enemy we encountered was just one enemy per wave, but their HP exceeded 10k, so it felt like you're just fighting a gauntlet of tough enemies as you go. The battle wages on, and the music, oh, the music is so good. It's just pushing me to keep going further, to finally see the end of this game. Hopefully! The first group reaches the first bio, and the boss for this section is just three ruin beasts, so really nothing crazy. We take them down with ease, and honestly, I was praying and hoping that the other battles would be just as easy because I just need a break from this game finally. After defeating them, World contacts us, telling us that the other groups are facing trouble and she can teleport us to them. Because, you know what? This girl's just full of surprises, I'm not gonna question it anymore. Our MC is then teleported to assist the other two groups, and the first group we help faces a golem! A big... 30k HP tanky ass golem who makes quick work of my group. Needless to say, I wiped. And there is no checkpoint, you just have to start from the very beginning once you do it again. The final section of this game requires you to have everyone leveled up enough so they can take it on, so that they may be able to do a bit of damage but also not get one-shotted. I get having a core set of people that you use to help you get through most of the game's content and you just bench the rest like you would in like, say, Fire Emblem or like Pokemon, but imagine those two games also telling you, hey, you need to have all your Pokemons or your units leveled up so they can take on the final level because you're bringing them all to the final level. It is just bonkers to me. And okay, before you start, I I know that this game doesn't have as many units or Pokemons as those games do, but having to go back and subject myself to menu work task grind is annoying. I am about to quit. I wanted to explode. I don't think I can handle another session of grinding people to be sufficient enough to tackle on the final quest. I'm already nearing the 40 hour mark and 90% of this game was just menu the game. My spirit was broken and I was finding it almost hard to continue. Almost. I was so close to the end that I couldn't just let this go. So, I dedicated a few more hours of grinding to get everyone close to a good enough level and geared them up. Bringing the whole party up to level 50 or so and making sure they can survive a few hits. Now, their damage may not be the key to success, it really wasn't. But where they shine the best is trying to build up my chain combo so that way I can finish off with a chance with my stronger units. The gang is finally leveled up and I took the time to gear them. It's time to take on the finale, round two. I paired each group with people who can carry for damage and pray this was the recipe for success. The grand finale music was blasting its way into my veins and I felt so much more ready this time. My first party consists of using Bruno's magic to soak the enemies and allowing me to use my lightning to finish them off. First bio was a breeze and everyone remained healthy. Now, bio two was the golem and that's the wall that stopped me last time. Using a hunter gilda, her reign of arrows almost always applied the arrow stats onto enemies to help me build or kick off chains. Now, because of how bad the job system was in this game, I tried to put a healer in each group. Bruno was the healer with a strong single target healing. I placed him in the first group. Melhard was the designated healer, but his party-wide heal was just 
awful. And we managed to get away with the golem fight before we started taking any more losses on group two. World then teleports us to the last area, but before she does that, we are teleported to an area that is essentially between spaces. Here, World talks to us before her potential end with us in case things don't go according to plan. She asks us, how do we feel about Ephel? And we respond with saying that she's important to us. World expresses a bit of jealousy, and honestly, who can really blame her when you have a clone of yourself essentially living out the life that you always wanted? One final request from World is that she asks us to look over Ephel after this is all over. We agree, putting her mind at ease. World tells us that all we do is for Ephel, and then we tell her that it is all for her as well. She thanks us, and then we're put into the final area of the game. We are back in Arabia, and honestly, the silence before the final boss coming up, it just really starts to hit me that this is finally it. I pair Rubens with my two core members, Roselta and Adelaide, because, well... I honestly didn't really know where to stick them. The bio transformed to protect itself, and we must disarm this defense system to start the breaking process. The gang starts throwing out their usual moves, and overall, this fight is really easy because I just over prep for it. But I will 100% take the over prepping over the chance of failure for coming this far in a mission that is nearly 40 minutes long. And I even land my first ever sweet 9,999 hit on the final boss, which was extremely satisfying to see. Ruben nearly gets knocked in this fight, but honestly, I would be okay with it because if he dies, we can still keep up the fight with all of our damage and plus the heals from Adelaide being the cleric. The group starts to take a lot of good damage so I decide to end this once and for all with one last bake spell I, from the chef class of course. I obliterate the boss's remaining 6k HP with another 9999 hit. With the defense system finished we can now end this game. Now to break the bios. At this point there's no telling if it will succeed or not but we have to try. We could lose Whirl, Ethel, or maybe both. Whirl's magic is taken from her now the next part is to destroy all the bios at the same time which we do with ease. Next up was Ethel who started the absorption process as we cheered her on. Gilda giving the final words from the party comforts her by telling her that she She's her best friend. <laughs> then, a flash and silence. The year is 230 of the Imperial Era. A certain power was dispelled from the continent of Antuisha. Those who even noticed this power existed were few and far between, though most realized something had happened. All that can be said is this, time at least returned its slow march forward. Whirl finally wakes up and she's actually here in person with us, not a projection. She then asks us about Ethel, and we don't have an answer for her. Just silence. And then Ethel's loud ass busts through the door saying that she's okay. Ethel and Whirl both came out fine and the curse was finally broken. The whole gang shows up with food and now Whirl can finally live her life as a normal person. With Whirl's new dream and goals being to travel alongside our group and see how we shape Antoisha. And with that, brings an end to my long 40-hour grind of various day life. Various day life is honestly not bad, but it's also not good. The characters do feel like a breath of fresh air, and they're really nice to be around and talk to. And the music is just so fantastic for a game such as this. I found myself actually listening to the music after because it's just so beautiful. And the art associated with the game is just really cute and well drawn. But besides those elements of the game, everything else is just a slog to play through. The feeling of getting past a huge grind to overcome a tough expedition only to repeat that again is something that I don't easily recommend to many people out there. The game is honestly not worth its price at $30, and I wouldn't even recommend this game at even $15 or $10. I would say maybe around $3.50 may be a good price. Yeah, let's go with that. $3.50. And the story itself doesn't actually take off until you're in the mid to late game, but once you're there, it's far better than the early game. I wouldn't say it's an RPG masterpiece when it comes to storytelling, but it did a pretty good job of keeping me interested and invested. And maybe because it's originally a mobile game, that's why it's so built around being grindy, but honestly, if they just would have fixed a few things up, it would be a pretty good game.
And once the credits roll, you'll get one last scene with your partner character, and it's Roselta bugging me with more exploration work. Gilda tries to stop Roselta because she has a mountain of paperwork to do. Now, whether Gilda tried to stop her out of responsibility of work or jealousy because now Roselta's my partner is a mystery we'll never find out. She tells us to get ready to escape town before Gilda can catch up and lock her down for paperwork. Roselta then tells us to remember, once my assistant, always my assistant. There's never a dull moment with Roselta, and through our experiments together, she's always smiling, and honestly hearing that made my heart kind of like, ugh, I wanted to cry a little bit. She tells us our time together has been almost too wonderful, and if she didn't know any better, she'd say she's been cursed. And to end it all off, we are then treated with a final art piece featuring her and a timeline of everything that's happened during our exploration of the Great Continent, and Tuisha. And this is what I'm talking about. This game has so many abysmal grinds and it's really painful to play through, but moments like this kind of make it worth it in a weird way. Finishing this game gave me a bittersweet feeling. Glad the game is over, but when it all came to a close, that meant the end of this game, the cast, and the world of Various Daylife. The game is heavily inflated by all the grinding, and honestly, the story is really short, but besides that, the game is really precious in its own way. My initial start to this video was essentially to venture so deep into this game to see how bad it was, but I came out loving it in a weird way, and that's my relationship to this game. It's a weird love for a game that could have had a lot more touching up and fix to it. Maybe it's Stockholm Syndrome, I don't know. Various Daylife is a game that I don't easily recommend, but it can be uniquely rewarding with its cast, music, dialogue, and art. This game became my new guilty pleasure, and I think a lot of us have something we like to indulge in that's a little bit considered bad or not so great, whether it's a TV show, a movie, or a game. Thank you to my patrons out there who support my work, and also if you want to consider supporting my Patreon, you can do so by checking out my page below for a low price of $3.50. And thank you to my newest patrons, Reomax, Strange Dispenser, Rice and Noodle, and Hunter. Join if you want to get your name on the credits for my future videos, and hang out in my private Discord server where I pretty much respond to nearly every message in there. Thank you for watching, guys.